the CSRs. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Monday, October 26, 2019, and this is the 28th, 2019, Public Works and Finance Committee of Moscow. Uh, first item up on the agenda today is the approval of the minutes from the 14th. They look good to me. And they look good to me, too. I wasn't here, but I read them, and they looked good. Ah, excellent. Item number two, professional service pre-qualification process resolutions, starring Bill Beltnap. Let's just do that. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. How's everybody doing today? <clears throat> so, provide a little bit of background. Uh, as as the council is aware, the city frequently requires the services of design professionals for a variety of projects that we design <clears throat> and construct including streets and sewer and water systems, uh, even to police stations and other city facilities and buildings. Uh, so do we, we do require those services fairly frequently. Um, the state of Idaho requires the procurement of professional services, and those are really professional architects, engineers, construction managers, land surveyors, and other design professionals it has to be made based upon their individual qualifications and their demonstrated competence in performing those <laughs> services. When the city procures that, then we are required to advertise a request for statements of qualifications in the same manner as required for bidding a public project. So typically that includes two publications, usually 30 days advertisement period, and that second publication no less than two weeks um, from when bidding is due. So we have to go through that process on an individual basis. There are two options allowed under the Idaho Code. The first is to do specific project specific requests for proposals. This was really kind of our historical practice. When we had a project that we knew we were going to need some assistance with, we would advertise a request for statements of qualifications for that work. We would go through review and rank individuals and then select the firm that we felt was most qualified for the project and then negotiate the scope of the contract and the fee for the work. Uh, but the other provision that's allowed in Idaho code is to create a list of pre-qualified uh, professional service providers. And if you do that, following the same advertisement publication process, you can create a pre-qualified -qualif list of professional service providers. And then you can, as <clears throat> the need for design services arise, you can uh, request a, a task order and negotiate a scope of services with any of those individual providers on your list without having to go back out and re-advertise and republish. Um, when you create that list, as I mentioned, you can then directly negotiate with any of you on that list for those services. And it does for allow for a more streamlined process when you anticipate you're going to have multiple water sewer projects or street design projects to have that pre-qualified list, especially if you do it every two or every three years, then you, you aren't going through that review of 20 SOQs ranking and evaluating those professionals. You have that list of people you've already deemed as being qualified and competent to perform those services, and then as the needs arise, you can move forward with individual task orders on projects. <clears throat> that is the process that the city began in 2017, uh, which was to develop that uh, list of professional services roster after going through the advertisement review and qualification process. Uh, when staff did that in 2017, we did advise council of that process, and what typically happened was there was a master services agreement that came to the council along with that first task order um, for assistance that we wished the firm to provide, uh, and we were allowed to engage in that on an as-needed basis. And then any future task orders underneath that same master services agreement was then approved by the city supervisor on behalf of the city for projects that the, the council had already appropriated for in the budget for that fiscal year. Uh, we were, have been requested to formalize this pre-qualification process, and so that's what we're here to talk about today as a resolution that would ad identify the process we intend to follow and the frequency by which we would go through that advertisement process. Uh, so we do have a draft resolution that would, that would outline a process for this pre-qualification. Um, largely, it would identify that every three years we'll go through a new um, request for statements of qualifications 
Historically, the cities advertised that on different types of design services. They had general civil, they had water specific or sewer specific, so they could qualify firms that maybe specialize on those individual utility systems or those that provided more general civil engineering, but all of those were done essentially at one time, and any firm could submit under one or more than one categories of services that they felt they were qualified to provide to the city. So we're proposing we would do that every three years. Um, I think last time they got somewhere near 25 statements of qualifications. It's a fairly in-depth review process um, to uh, evaluate the individual firms, their staff members, their knowledge and expertise and relevant experience. And so we're pr proposing to do that every three years. If you're doing that on an annual basis, it would become pretty uh, burdensome. Uh, we did wish to conduct an annual supplemental qualification process. You may have firms that weren't in existence at the time that you did that effort. And we don't want to lock anybody out from having the opportunity to provide serv those services to the city. So we'd run essentially a supplemental advertisement every year. Uh, that would allow for firms that uh, did not submit underneath the every three-year cycle uh, to provide their statements of qualifications for review and to be added to that roster. <clears throat> the, then all of the pre-qualified firms added to the roster would then be enter into a master services agreement with the city. And it's a fairly standard professional service agreement that just provides the, the legal framework for their delivery of design services to the city. And then as uh, work or projects would arise, uh, then individual task orders would be requested of firms. And then we would have the opportunity to negotiate uh, the scope and the budget for that individual service. And then um, the city supervisor would be able to authorize and execute that task order on behalf of the city. Uh, city would still retain the right to publish and request uh, qualifications or services for any project or secure other personal professional services that are authorized under, underneath Idaho Code. Specifically, this is addresses this resolution addresses those services that would be in excess of $25,000 in expense. Under Idaho Code today, if it's less than $25,000, you can just negotiate uh, those services with, with any qualified design professional that you wish to. Uh, when it gets over the $25,000 expenditures, when you have to go through the formal publication process and uh, review of statements of qualifications. Um, if there's any other, if there's a different project that may arise that we feel that the skill set doesn't exist on the roster, then we have the right to, on any individual project to go out to a separate um, SOQ request for qualifications and any person on the roster or any other uh, firm can certainly respond to that specific project's uh, statements of qualifications request. Um, we did receive a couple comments by email after publication of the agenda, <clears throat> and the first related to the may in place of shall as it relates to that annual supplemental advertisement. We did leave at as may with the intent of providing flexibility. If it happened to be one year before the end of the three-year rotation and we didn't anticipate any large projects or any design professional need, then we wouldn't have to go through the expense of having to advertise it for just that last year, and we'd go back through the standard three-year uh, renewal, or it could be that we just don't have any other projects in the pipeline for that year. Um, maybe projects are already under contract with, with design firms that would carry us out to that three-year time period. So we did provide, did include May that would give the city some flexibility <coughs> to make a determination of whether that supplemental, I, and I'm just really kind of focusing on that year two of the three-year renewal process of whether it's really necessary for us to go out if we have, for example, our goal is to start to get two years out on design of projects. And if we already had that kind of window covered, do we really need to go through the effort, publication expense and effort of going through a supplemental for that last year? So the May does give the city some flexibility of deciding uh, when and if it wishes to go through that. Uh, the other comment that was received was whether there was a potential need for a formal uh, removal process from that roster whether we needed to have somewhat of a disbarment process if we felt there was a firm that we were dissatisfied with their service or maybe there was some other issue going on. And the city reserves the sole right and discretion to issue task orders to any of the firms on the list. Um, if that was the case, we would just not re you know, request uh, proposals for them for any projects if we felt that was the case. Um, you know, we do intend that the um, the firms that will end up on the pre-qualified list are going to be highly, highly qualified with a great deal of experience. We really haven't had that experience since 2017 that one of the firms that was qualified in the list, we felt that we did not want to have on the list any longer. Uh, and we, so we do feel that we could just manage that situation by just not engaging them on projects if we felt that was the case. And then as they went through the requalification re process, if there were grounds to do so, then we just would not include them on the roster in the next uh, three year cycle rotation. Staff does recommend approval of the proposed resolution to the City Council, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. 
Gary. As Bill indicated, we've been using this process advised the council back in 2016, 2017. Um, we've got some master agreements that after they came to council, you might have four to five, <coughs> eight task orders on. Uh, the reason we wanted to make this into a resolution that council, we could depend on as staff, but also to kind of guide the process was because some of those uh, master agreements started off with a fairly small um, amount, like a $12,000 study, and then the next task order might be something like a $75,000 design contract. So we wanted to make sure that we had the process all lined out. It's worked very well so far. We've got several of those task orders that are still currently being executed at this point. It's all been fine. Uh, it's been in accordance with council um, authorization through their appropriation process and the budgeting process. Uh, Bill also indicated we're very close to having a uh, capital improvement program put together for our utilities. So we'll be bringing that to you within the next couple of months, which should make more and more transparency to this process, which is what we're after. We want to make sure that firms that didn't exist at the, at the time that the uh, process was first advertised still have a method to get into the process uh, new engineering firms something like that they'd still be able to do that there's flexibility built in and shell is I, I love the word shell but it's also a tank trap for people if you uh, you know Idaho reports is filled with cases of public uh, bidding firms that somebody didn't cross their T's or dot their I's and the aggrieved uh, firm that didn't get the bid would sue because of some technicality. And we don't want to get into that situation. If 37 months goes by and we have not re-advertised, um, we don't want someone coming in saying, well, I didn't get a chance to bid on that or you selected this other firm because of me, your process is no good. So it just allows that sort of flexibility. It really behooves the city to advertise when it's necessary to do so. If you're getting stagnant, you have some people who maybe you're not getting the services you want and I would rely as I have on the engineering department to take a look at the firms that we've got, Do the does the expertise that of the folks on the list, do they meet our needs? If not, we'll then make the decision to go out for an, an RFP um, or a bid process to get someone, SOQ, uh, to come in and say, okay, say we have a, uh, an activity that no, nobody's qualified to do, we can go out on a separate process to, to get that expertise that we need. So it seems to me that the resolution memorializes that policy of the council and, and it looks good the way it's written as far as I'm concerned. And if I may, it does address several things. I think when we started in 2017, when the engineering department began this process, it really wasn't formalized of how frequently they would go through a requalification process or how those firms that weren't here present before would get on the list. In practice, some firms just gave statement of qualifications after that initial process and got added to the roster, even though it wasn't in response to an actual published request for qualifications. So this will just help give some structure and foundation framework for the engineering staff to follow as they go through this process in the future. So, so could a um, firm that's either new to town or has gained the experience needed to qualify where maybe they didn't have it in the open period, could they request uh, to be evaluated outside of that yearly time frame? They could not. I mean, it has okay. to be in response to a publication. So the, w the way that this is stated in statute is that essentially you can create that pre-qualified list after following all the publication requirements as required for the public bidding of public works construction projects. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's part of the issue of some, we did have some getting added, uh, just I think one or two to the list, but that was really outside of that formal published uh, process. So we do need to follow that. What we would tell them is that we're gonna do that in January and, and be ready to submit your statement of qualifications when we do that. So if any firm contacted us and wants to get on the list, we would let them know when we're gonna be publishing that so they can be ready to respond. And then they can be added to the list after that publication and evaluation process. Mm -hmm. That if there was another RFQ for a specific project, though, they would be okay to respond to that. They just wouldn't be on the pre-qualified list. Right, but that would only <coughs> happen in the case that it was, say, exceeded $25,000 and it was felt that the current list of it qualified contractors needs. wasn't sufficient. That would likely be the case, yes. 
Yeah. So, yeah. And oh, that was my question. Basically, would we ever do it on a rolling basis? Which you answered. Yeah, the goal is to do it every year, just to provide that opportunity. Uh, and, and if we, if we, you know, we we could publish on demand, but I think it'd be better to do a more structured, just right. save on cost, same time and effort. Uh, we do have a, a particular work workflow of the year from the design to construction season, and we're gonna try to find those a little bit slow, small, very s small, slow periods to go through this process on that three-year basis and on the annual basis as well. So every three years, does everybody in the list need to re-up the qualifications? They do. So you can, you can apply once every year, but then once you've been on the list, you could you have to reapply after three years. Is that correct? correct? Okay. Correct. Yeah. Thank so you. so you either apply during the three year cycle and mm -hmm. you get on the list and you're good for the next three years, or if you happen to come in supplemental year two and you're year one or year two, we put you on the list. But then we are going to do a requalification of everybody on that three year cycle. Gotcha. So if you applied in the second year, you'd have two years. It's the end of the three years. And, and most firms already have their pre, perf, you know, pre form statements and qualifications to submit fairly quickly. Gotcha. You said. It would the twenty five thousand dollar threshold. I was always under the impression that it was fifty thousand. Not for 25. professional services. So there are different standards for either bidding of construction or procurement of, of personal property. Mm -hmm. When it comes to design professionals, there is a specific exemption that you you don't have to follow the qualifications based process if the expense or the cost of the proposed professional services is less than twenty five thousand. You also need to understand that when you put out an RFQ we don't make decisions based on price. We make decisions based on qualifications. Price isn't negotiated until after the qualified firm has been selected. So in the example you gave where someone comes mid-cycle new mm -hmm. and they, they're told that will open in January, um, I'm just trying to see how it could possibly conflict with the idea that let's say it is year two of the three-year cycle and you don't have any projects planned in the next year. So then you've told them, come back in January, but then you've decided since we have no projects, we're not going to publish <coughs> this. It just seems like it makes it, you have to keep track of the fact that, well, we have nothing going on, so we're not going to spend the money to publish it. But but in this case, someone asked back in October, so I guess we better. So I, it might just be cleaner to just do it every year. I know there's a little cost to that, but. To, mm. to re-qualify? To, no, to, no get, to do the, to oh, do the, the annual thing. To I mean, I, I and, and, maybe and, we know, can. There can be a different wording other than shall, or maybe it can have within shall annually within uh, two or three months. You know, give some kind of cushion. But yeah, I think in reality, <coughs> it's not like we're inundated with professional firms. Engineering wise, we probably got five firms that we deal with most of the time? Mostly, and I, th and I think we have about eight firms qualified under each of the specific um, design specialty areas. And, and the, you know, the, the city could make a list and say these are going to be the, two, you know, the three or four, and, and you can reapply in three years. Um, so we're not, I guess the city's not legally obligated to provide that opportunity every year. It was just kind of a courtesy that, that we want to provide that opportunity if there's somebody who wasn't in the in the area. There aren't a lot of firms here locally exactly. that yeah. we would expect to see come well, up, but we did want to provide that because we didn't necessarily want to lock them out for, for a right. three-year time period from having the opportunity to provide service to the city. So it, it is, I mean, it was our goal to, to provide that opportunity to have that supplemental. Right, and I like that. I think that's smart because we may not have many here right now, but you never know sure. when someone new comes in from somewhere mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would do an amazing job on something, and I would hate for them to have to sure. hold out for 18 months, whereas if, if yearly there, that opportunity was there. On the other hand, that would be <coughs> causing them to go through the effort of applying, the city to go through the effort of screening that application, and then find out that there's nothing happening, and then you have to reapply again anyway well so it's already saying it will be a yearly process to invite new people it's just the it's just coming down to the question of is it going to happen every year or is it at the discretion of the city if it happens every year well I guess the question to me would be assuming that it costs let's just assume it costs three thousand dollars to run the publication mm -hmm. in the process Spending that money in order that someone, as Art indicated, maybe you don't have any work anyway. You just got to wonder if that makes sense because 
staff will, as we want to have as many qualified uh, firms as we possibly can have. If someone comes into town, they're a brand new firm, they look promising, then it would make sense for us to do it to invite them in. Um, whether they're projects or not, who knows? But is that a good expenditure of the public funds to mandate that you have to go out every three years, not have any of that discretion when, say, nobody has moved to town, you're just publishing it for the heck of publishing it? So, so what in that case where someone inquires, it's outside of the period, and you say it will come in January, then does that mean you just have, you will keep track of that and do it just because someone has inquired? That will so that mean we're going to spend the money to do it. That's my general thought. I mean, if we actually had a firm, if if for example, you're year two of three and <coughs> nobody's made an inquiry of you, we may make the decision not to go ahead and advertise it because we are not aware of any firm that has an interest that's made an inquiry and we're going to be going through the full requalification in just you know 12 months from then. That would be the situation that I would see that that discretion allows us a flexibility to say, hey, we're not going to spend the money on that publication because we're just going to be doing this in 12 months. We already have next year's projects all lined up and under <coughs> design with existing firms, and we've not received any inquiry from any firms that want to be added to the list. That would be the scenario that I think we would likely say, hey, we're just going to not re-advertise this year, and we'll pick it up on the full requalification cycle. Um, if we had a firm that, that appeared to be qualified, appeared to want to do provide services to the city, and we were earlier in that cycle, then I'd say if we received that request, it would make sense for us to go ahead and do that annual uh, supplemental advertisement opportunity. Mm -hmm. That may give us that flexibility to try to gauge that and decide when we think it's appropriate to do the supplemental or not. And even though you get in situations where you have hydraulic firms that deal with wastewater or whatever, you want to have as much competition as you can have. You want as many qualified people as you can on there. If you only have one, then yeah. they can essentially drive the price where they want. So it would make sense for us if we have someone who is qualified, ready to come in, to advertising it then. The idea is, does it make sense to do it by rote if it isn't going to advantage the city at all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or open it up for, for a application from a firm if there's no firms out there. Uh, and then with with the um, when you said if there was I know it hasn't happened and hopefully it never will happen but that someone on the list is for some reason now deemed somebody that we're dissatisfied we with their service yeah, that you just wouldn't solicit the work from them and if they were say the only hydrologist on there then you're just not even going to Ask We'd have to go them. out to separate SOQ yep. for a yeah. project we required those services. And if you had, in that scenario, if you have a firm that specializes in one of the disciplines and you haven't been satisfied with their work, when a project came up, your choice is, well, do you take the pre-qualified? Well, no, we haven't been satisfied with their work. So you naturally would advertise for that particular project and get some more of a broad-based response from a firm that perhaps doesn't practice in Moscow very often but might want to come in for this one particular job <coughs> yeah so you won't it's as you described before you won't be stuck with someone because they've given a low exactly. bid because it's qualifications it's qualifications price. based and if we are dissatisfied with their performance or services we will not engage them for those any further okay. well, good any, any, with the three-year requalification part, would there be any reason to word it so that that definitely happens every three years rather than the may happen every three years? It, I mean, I know this is a similar question, but. Yeah, you get, in my mind as an attorney, it just opens up a, a pitfall or a tank trap for the unwary. Mm -hmm. These typically, if, if you've got, I mean, say Mia is watching it every three years and it comes up, she's certainly going to say, okay, every three years you have to do it. But typically this is a piece of the process that legal deals with, administration deals with, but engineering is going to deal with all the time. <coughs> so there is a chance that they may go over, and if they go over, does that mean everybody on the list is, is off then and you can't do anything until you requalify? Mm -hmm. So it just, again, provides some flexibility. It makes sense to do it every three years, but should you happen to miss it for some reason, then it doesn't invalidate the process that's in place. And so I 
assume that if it's missed and once it's realized, then it will happen. It mm -hmm. won't like Correct. wait another Correct. year or right. another three years. Right. I mean, it's and it just may be workflow, staffing, projects. It may be three years and two months before we get to re-advertising. It just gives us a little bit of flexibility. It, it, that speaks to our intent to do this on a regular basis, to require everybody to be requalified, our intent to provide that annual supplemental process, but doesn't give us down to, you know, if you don't do it within the last hour, essentially it invalidates mm -hmm. everything. It just gives that flexibility. But this is clearly the intent of the program that we want to establish. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so being an ordinance, this goes on regular agenda? Uh, yes. Yeah. As a resolution. It oh, it's a resolution, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so it could go on consent if you... Uh, I'm happy with consent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry about that. Talk me into an ordinance there. <laughs> <laughs> Resolution Draft ordinance. Uh, okay. Okay, next up is the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality Domestic S Water System Loan Offer Phase 2. All kinds of exciting things this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> this was a little more exciting. Than oh, yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> so in 2014, the city sought judicial confirmation for a, a number of water, domestic water system improvements uh, to allow the issuance of uh, revenue bonds to make those improvements. And they were specifically related to um, the reconstruction of six boost water booster stations and the development of a new domestic well and some limited piping associated with both the well and the booster stations. The booster stations, when they were constructed many years ago, were not sized for fire flow requirements. And when the city did the water system comprehensive plan here in 2010, uh, it identified that we had number, a number of areas within the city that we were not meeting required fire flow minimums to address fire suppression. Um, in many areas, that's just some piping upsizing, but in those high pressure zones, it actually required reconstruction of the booster stations and, and additional pumps that could then provide supply that volume of water to our high pressure zones. Um, DEQ also uh, had a requirement that we <coughs> needed to be able to provide our uh, water production requirements by t after taking our highest producing well offline, which is well nine at the moment. Also, uh, that did require the drilling of a new well. And then we had some piping uh, improvements related to largely the Indian Hills booster station. So the area of Indian Hills Drive and surrounding neighborhood, the water main in those streets, about 3,400 feet, was undersized to then receive the fire flow from the new Indian Hills booster station. So that was another large component uh, of those improvements. As I mentioned, those were necessary to meet fire flow and redundancy of water source. Um, because of that, the court determined that these were ordinary and necessary improvements and the city could go out and could incur debt to uh, complete the improvements without uh, having a public vote on the matter. On June, then in June of 2014, the city council accepted a revolving loan fund uh, offer from the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality for $4.3 million. Uh, to re be repaid over 20 years at two and a quarter percent interest rate uh, from the revolving loan funds. So that was viewed as being pretty favorable rates and returns, not quite as good as the uh, police b general obligation bond, uh, but for a revenue bond, uh, this was really pretty uh, favorable rates. Uh, the drilling well 10 was then completed in December of 2016, and then shortly thereafter, in April of 17, we issued the notice to proceed uh, for the the first of the six, we had three booster stations that were included in phase one. So we had Taylor, White Avenue, and Vista. Those three booster stations started construction then in April of 2017. Um, the well has been completed as far as the drilling. Um, those booster stations have been constructed and there's just some final punch list items that are being worked through right <coughs> now. We're hopeful probably within the next 60 days we'll be fully complete with the first phase of those three booster stations. So the remaining improvements that we have on the list are two additional booster stations. Now I did say six before. Um, one, the Mosier booster station was, was proposed to be in the design process of phase one. It was determined that the Vista station could also feed the Mosier high pressure station if we had a water line that connected the two. So the, the proposal this time is to not reconstruct Mosier and make that connection. And Vista was then assized appropriately during the design and construction to be able to feed both uh, high pressure zones. So we have two remaining booster stations, the Ponderosa and the Indian Hills Drive stations, as well as then the remaining development of Well 10. And then we have that 3,400 uh, linear feet of water main in the Indian Hills area for reconstruction. 
we have pretty much utilized all. Uh, we're down to maybe about 40,000 left of the 4.3 million of that initial uh, DEQ loan for those improvements. Uh, we still, the remaining improvements, the most recent estimates appear to indicate about 6.8 million uh, left to complete uh, those remaining projects. So at the time of judicial confirmation, some of the cost estimates that were utilized at that time were from 2010. And obviously we didn't start the well development till 16, the booster station till 17, and this next phase of booster and well completion here in 21, 20 and 21. So costs have escalated fairly significantly. Um, so the end result is while we have accumulated about 5.3 million in the water capital fund, that is inadequate to complete these remaining necessary system improvements. Uh, and even if we were to, let's say, hold off and try to accumulate over the next two years, we would essentially deplete the entire water capital fund trying to complete these, and we would not leave any remaining um, funds to address other capital system needs within the utilities operation. So as a result, uh, DEQ has offered an additional $4.3 million to the city to complete these improvements under the same terms and conditions as the initial loan offer. Um, the city and DEQ would then close out that initial loan. So once we get full completion on the phase one, we'd close out that loan. We'd, we would have essentially that would become a separate promissory note and we would start repayment on the first installment of the 4.3. Uh, we would then begin completion of well 10 in 2020 and probably <coughs> the booster stations and in 2021. And then we would close out the second phase of the loan likely in 2022 or early 2023 and begin commencement on repayment on that installment at that point. Um, accepting that phase two loan will allow us to preserve at least two and a half million in that water capital fund balance to fund additional system needs, uh, which is going to be necessary. Uh, DEQ is currently finalizing the loan offer. We had actually anticipated to receive it on Thursday of last week to have in the packet, but it's been circulating around uh, DEQ's offices to get the director's signature on the loan offer. We do expect it either today or tomorrow um, that we'll receive the signed loan offer that will then come to the full council for consideration. Uh, I did include a copy of the 2014 loan offer. It's going to be the same terms and conditions that we received in that loan offer at that point in time. Uh, we have prepared resolution for the council's consideration. This essentially allows acceptance of phase two of the state revolving loan funding to support the completion of those improvements. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions the committee may have. Gary. Uh, as Bill indicated, uh, we'd originally thought that 4.3 million was going to be sufficient to do these improvements. Um, in addition to the increased cost, the inflation that had occurred over the nine years since the original estimates were made, uh, there were changes in the way booster stations are configured. And those <coughs> changes came after uh, the loan had already been approved and our budgets had been set. So there was quite a bit of a, uh, additional initial cost. In addition, the fire flow um, is a huge issue. That's one of the reasons that the, the court gave us judicial confirmation to be able to issue revenue bond or revenue debt uh, for this project. Fire flow is one of the things that uh, cities are expected to uh, provide. It goes into our fire rating, protection of the public, so on and so forth. One of the things we're doing as well, as we've indicated, is we're asking uh, the Idaho Department of Water Resources to allow us multiple points of diversion so that we can utilize Well 10 to help us uh, have the flow that we need for our fire flow, which hopefully will allow us not to have to uh, construct as many reservoirs in the future as well. So it's all part of a big uh, process that we're going through. Um, as Bill indicated, as we're moving forward with a, a CIP and trying to figure out, we're going through a rate study in the Water and Sewer Fund right now, and if we expend all reserves on these projects, then the rate will have to be adjusted so that we can recoup some capital monies for those things that are unanticipated, unidentified at this point, and projects that are already in the pipeline. So it allows us to utilize <coughs> long-term debt to even out those rates. Not saying the rates are going to be, you know, zero, they won't be. The cost of everything is going up, but it allows us to manage our debt load in uh, comparison with what future rates will be. So it makes sense. 2.25% is very competitive. We checked with uh, Piper Jaffrey, who uh, was the financier on the police bond. Uh, they couldn't get within a quarter percent of that. 
So the DEQ loan is uh, significantly less cost because you don't have to go through all the bond issuance costs and all of those things that we had to or would have to as we did uh, with the police bond. So it makes sense in this case to move forward. Um, and we've talked to finance directors been involved as well as the city attorney. Uh, bond council has been advised that that original um, uh, judicial confirmation will extend to the $4.3 million additional loan. So the, for once, the ducks are lined up for us to move forward upon the council's resolution. Yeah, I remember being on council back when we got the first judicial confirmation, and then not more than a few months later, they changed the rules over how the pump stations had to be constructed, and all of a sudden the price went through the ceiling. And that was quite disappointing, but... Uh, still maintaining proper fire flow to the neighborhoods and providing access to well 10 if we can get the multiple points of diversion in place it all makes sense in a larger scheme and it's one of those things that as a municipality we have to do to assure the safety and provision of services to the citizens and I have a question Brandy? Yeah. Um, so how much is remaining to be paid back on the first loan? All of it. All of it. Okay, so so we're still in the okay. construction loan phase. So we've okay. taken disbursements. So you, so it's on a reimbursement basis. We we make the expenditures on the projects, and then we submit a request for reimbursement from DEQ. We get reimbursed for that, and we are essentially in a construction loan phase. So as soon as we get the final completion on phase one of the projects, the record drawings, which we actually now have, and the final. Um, operations and maintenance <coughs> manuals which we're waiting one for one last piece we will close out the phase one loan we will have then essentially a bond ordinance will come to the council that will have the essentially the promissory note of the bond that will be paying to DEQ and the payment schedule amortization schedule so we have not started paying on that yet mm -hmm. we are however paying interest on the construction funds and so what's the rate on that one it's the same, same, oh, okay. it's the same rates, uh, so we've accumulated about 175000 in construction interest so far on the Phase 1 projects, and that gets deducted from the $4.3 million. Just like constructing a house. Yes. Oh, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly that the additional $4.3 million will end up being more than we need to complete the project, but it will allow us to retain some in the fund balance, is that? It will be less than what we need to complete the projects, but when you combine that with existing capital balance, we will have more than necessary and leave us with some of the city's own fund balance left over. I guess that's what I mean. We wouldn't need that full amount if we took everything from the fund balance, but then we would have nothing in the fund balance. Correct. Y if you wanted to take 2.5 out of the 4.3, <coughs> we could be left with zero in the water fund balance, capital fund balance, which we would not advise. And that would affect water rates to a larger degree. Yeah. There's yeah. The two loans, well, it'll take about a million and a half, a little more than that, of fund balance or accumulation in order to complete the projects. The two loans plus about 1.5, roughly. Um, so we will, as Bill said, a little over 2.5 million, allowing us to move forward with other projects. And mm -hmm. um, it just get really nervous when your accumulations get down that low. If something comes up, you can't deal with it. In this situation, judicial confirmation has already been approved. Mm -hmm. The money's there for us to take advantage of it. If something were to come up that we needed to um, go into capital for accumulation, if it isn't there, then we might be going back up to court and asking for judicial confirmation on a particular project. So it just allows us to face it's the best sort of sure <coughs> way that's predictable where we know we have this, these projects covered that need and, to happen. And if we have to go back and are prepared and for ask, something unknown. If we have to go back and ask for more, there's a timeline out there. And if something needs to be done now, then you're really stuck. Well, and there are 30 other projects on the list above and beyond yeah. these. Um, many of those also addressing fire flow deficiencies. So we need to reserve enough capital to get those <coughs> completed. And the only projects that were the subject of the digital confirmation were the booster stations, Well 10, and the Indian Hills water main. So any other system improvements to address fire flow deficiencies, either we have to, if we wish to incur debt, would have to go back and get judicial confirmation again, which is difficult and challenging, or, you know, we have to fund it with our own resources and our own capital. So the goal here is to 
you know, utilize the advantage of that judicial confirmation and preserve enough fund balance in the water fund to, to address the other remaining projects that affect fire flow using our own capital. Yeah. So it's like a great opportunity to... It really uh, is. Yeah. Okay. And? I was just going to ask, do we have an estimate on how long it's going to take to pay both those loans off? So they're both 20-year terms. Um, and so one, I'm, we're expecting we will start in the FY20 fiscal year, so that'll be retired in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then we're, depending upon when we close out phase two, it'll be 20 years following the completion of those projects. So if that begins in 22 or 23, it'll be 20 years after that. Do you so think there's, oh, I was just gonna say, do you think there's any chance we'll pay those off sooner? I know there are a lot of factors that go into that. I don't know the term of DEQ's loan. Yeah. I think they're simple, they're simple and, and there's, there's no, but as Bill indicated, there's 30 other projects in the works mm -hmm. from need to be done in five years, need to be done in 10 years, may need to be done in 30 years. So with inflation, construction inflation <coughs> being where it is, I highly doubt. Um, and there's no windfalls you get in an enterprise fund. Um, you know, you still have the same cost of production. You have the same cost of infrastructure. So I would doubt it. Now, the council could choose to raise rates more than they need to mm -hmm. to build up a fund balance and pay it off early if they wanted but at 2.25 percent it's a pretty competitive interest rate so we could run the models to advise future councils if they wanted to do that but uh, i would highly doubt that that would be a route that a council would want to go mm -hmm. and as gary mentioned it really would be dependent upon the rates and if we want to keep those at a reasonable level and address the 30 other projects on the list we will the water fund will not likely have any excess capital to apply to you know accelerating the repayment on those loans after 10 years it might get a little bit better mm -hmm. uh, but for the next 10 years the water fund has not carried any debt service and so picking up these two loans will will put a burden upon the, the fund that it won't have a lot of excess capital unless rates are yeah, and to clarify, that's the only fund that we'll be using to pay off the loans. Correct. Correct? Yeah, okay. these are revenue bonds, so just tied to the the uh, utility, the water fund. Yeah, I you. think if I could just digress for a moment, Bill indicated that we don't, we currently don't have any debt except for this DEQ loan in the water fund. We knew that we had capital intense uh, improvements that needed to be made. We did incur two different sewer bonds, as council knows that. Um, I believe in 2003 and 2008 uh, when those were incurred and those are due to be paid off I believe in 2022 or 24 24 because that's the year we're looking at the that's right 24 and then 34 I believe but it was because we had the huge cost of the wastewater treatment plant the water reclamation and reuse facility and all of the uh, costs associated with that so it was, and we also got judicial confirmation on those two bonds as well. And the reason was because we were under a DEQ uh, permit that we had to meet. In this case, the reason we got judicial confirmation was because of the um, nature of fire flow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, courts do not like to give um, judicial confirmation. You typically have to be under a mandate or it has to be an ordinary and necessary expense of government. In fact, there's a constitutional prohibition for a city to or county to incur debt beyond its budget year. So obviously a 20 year bond or 20 year long term debt wouldn't be something you'd be able to do without judicial confirmation. So uh, when Judge Stegner issued this in 2014, he saw the magnitude of the fire flow need and that's why um, he issued it at that time. I did have one curiosity question. The origination of DEQ offering the loan, do they, did does that come from them or did we ask or it's actually federal funds that are, are administered by the division or division that's going back some years Department of Environmental Quality um, so they get these federal funds and they may add some state funds to them as well what they're intended to do is address infrastructure um, um, I guess infrastructure deficiencies in different projects uh, we've had revolving loan fund for in fact, when we did our first phase, phase, I guess it was the third phase, phase three of the wastewater treatment plant, as it was called in those days, uh, we got uh, state revolving loan funds for that. And then we converted those to a bond, paid back the fund, and actually they forgave us some construction interest because of that. 
So we've had it on the sewer side, and they offered it now on the water side. And it's you apply for those funds, and you have to okay. show a deficiency in your infrastructure that meets the requirements of the, the loan award. Got it. So they didn't call you one day and say, hey, we do you want money? another $4.3 <laughs> million dollar loan? Um, <laughs> no, we called them asking if they had additional okay. funding left over. Yeah. Yes, and okay. uh, we were actually quite pleased. It was a very... Great. Uh, easy conversation good. with DQ and us to identify the need and they were willing to provide that additional 4.3 okay. but I think that the thoughtful incurring of long-term debt if there is a reason to do so and it allows you to mitigate increases in rates and as I said doesn't mean the rates aren't going to increase they will increase but it, it allows you to manage those peaks and valleys of your <coughs> infrastructure needs I think that's been amply showed by the sewer system and the water reclamation reuse facility it's just we did not have those same infrastructure needs identified for the water department till the last 10 years till the comp plan was completed yeah. really did identify those deficiencies you have something else in? Uh -huh. That's it for me. So I think move this along, but uh, I think given the financial nature of things, should we put it to the whole council? That would be my uh, recommendation. And since you don't have the final loan offer before you today, I think that's yep. appropriate. Yep. Cool. And I did want to mention that the resolution and the loan offer, once it's final loan offers, once it's received, will be reviewed by our bond council this week. And if there are any changes, we'll make you aware of those at the council meeting on Monday. Bill, you're not off the hook yet. Dang. It's the Idaho Department of Commerce Opportunity Fund Agreements. Bill was acting city supervisor last week, so oh. he gets to be the sole show. Uh, so <coughs> during MZ's recent site selection process, State of Idaho uh, offered a number of incentives to try to encourage MZ to ensure that their corporate headquarters was located in the state of Idaho and not in the state of Washington. Uh, one of those incentives that was offered was a $350,000 incentive from the state's Opportunity Fund, not to be confused with Opportunity Zones. This is a completely different program. Um, to <coughs> assist with financing or funding of necessary public infrastructure improvements. Uh, the Opportunity Fund operates much like uh, community development block grants or you know, rural community development block grants. Uh, with the exception of those are traditionally competitive um, applications. A city, a public agency or entity has, <coughs> has to be the applicant for those funds. They are public funds. It has to go to a public entity. Uh, so we do, we do that often. We've done it, obviously, for the fire trucks more recently. We've done CBGs for downtown. We've done RCBGs for fiber optic network extensions. So it kind of operates in a very similar way. Those funds generally can only go to public infrastructure as well, as is the case with the Opportunity Fund. The only difference is the, the Opportunity Fund is at the discretion of the Director of the State Department of Commerce. And so it's intended to be the Director's closing fund, that is funds that they have at their discretion to try to uh, push projects over the top. Um, as I mentioned, within the Opportunity Fund, the funding must be received by a public entity. Um, and if the public entity is not going to be constructing the public improvements, then the, then the public entity would then reimburse whoever is completing those improvements um, with the project. So because of that, it requires essentially two separate agreements for the city to enter into. Um, one will be between the city and the state, and essentially, and then the other is between the city and the company. So the, the city and the company agreement specifies essentially the improvements they're going to complete as part of the project, what we're making the contribution uh, to. Uh, the, city and the, the city and state agreement just states that the, the state will is making these funding available. The city will take responsibility for having an agreement between us and the, and the company that we will ensure that milestones are reached in accordance with the agreement and it sets forth the terms for the request for reimbursement of the funding. The, the funding in this case is proposed to be utilizing for the relocation of a portion of Hog Creek, which is a public stormwater uh, facility that crosses the property as well as sidewalk improvements around the perimeter of the property, including 10 foot wide sidewalk, street trees, decorative light fixtures and tree grates. Uh, so really frontage improvements around the entire perimeter of the site. The, the Hog Creek portion, as you may be aware, the city is um, participating in some oversizing of that facility, so this will not reimburse for oversizing costs. This is just going to be for the base, the base uh, work on the culvert, so there won't be a, a duplicate reimbursement for the oversizing cost, so that will not be included in this one. 
the total estimated cost of those improvements is seven hundred and fifteen thousand <coughs> seven hundred and ten dollars and so this is the site kind of worked best to lay it on the edge so north is here to the right of your screen as you can see here so jackson is going to be um well now yep. i'm totally disoriented um <laughs> yeah so <laughs> jackson will be on this side yeah. I don't like it when the world turns on its side. So uh, Jackson will be here on, on the <coughs> edge of the site. Um, then this obviously is C and then Almond over on this side and A Street down here on the south. So Hog Creek currently just kind of goes diagonal straight across the property from this manhole to a manhole across the street. Uh, so that has to be re relocated to make way for the building. So that'll be intercepted, come to the corner, turn here, come back, and then it'll rejoin uh, the storm system there downstream. Um, so that's the relocation of hog and then it's kind of hard to see but these are all the sidewalks tree wells decorative light fixtures around the perimeter of the site uh, i think council's probably has seen this i think it's in the paper and in the press but this is the the uh, proposed facility just under seventy thousand square foot corporate headquarters located on the site so the Funding is proposed to be dispersed in four equal installments. So the state likes to see milestones uh, of the project and to have at least four milestones. Uh, so the, the ones that have been identified between the company, the state, and the city. Uh, the first is the completion and acceptance of the Hog Creek relocation. And each of these are roughly 87,000 and change. Uh, so it's uh, the 350 in four equal pieces. Uh, the second will be issuance of a building permit and commencement of construction. At this point in time, they haven't commi commenced construction on the building. They're working on the Hog Creek relocation and advanced utility work at this point in time. But that'd be the second milestone. Uh, the third is completion of construction and issuance of, of certificate of occupancy. And then the last is a creation of 27 new jobs by the company. You'll see a lot of different job creation requirements that have been around. I think the county property tax exemption had 150. Um, the state's TRI, I think at 127 was the obligation uh, for this specific portion of the incentive funding is 27 jobs. So they all have kind of different and you'll see in the, uh, in the background description, you'll see 127 there. That is just background. That is the state's total incentive package refers that, but for this part of the funding, it's only 27 jobs. You also see 126 in the back. That is current employment. So we've got a lot of numbers that are very close to each other. Just wanted to kind of identify the differences between those uh, numbers there. But so that fourth milestone and the final disbursement would happen upon the creation of those 27 jobs at the company. Uh, these are reimbursement basis, so the company has to make the expenditure, complete the improvements, provide the supporting documentation on those expenses and any documentation necessary to support their achievement of the milestone before reimbursement would occur. Uh, the city would then submit a request for reimbursement uh, from the state and pass those <coughs> funds through to the company. Um, we have staggered the reimbursement payment time frame to be 45 days from us to the company and 30 days from the state to us to try to minimize any potential cash out of hand, loss of investment earnings that we may have in making those payments. So we wanna to try to cycle them through very quickly. Uh, the city has no other financial obligation, any cost overruns or anything of that nature are solely borne by the company and the city has no responsibility. Our, our contribution is staff time really to, to uh, process the reimbursement and to administer the agreements. Uh, so we have required or have prepared the required agreements for your review and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. So with the staffing requirements, are those overlapping? So if they hit 150, they've taken care Correct. of all of them? Yeah, they're all independent. So this agreement is just independent at the 27. Once that's completed, the, f the final milestones reached, the final disbursements made, then this contract's done. Also, uh, with the Hog Creek uh, issue, is this our opportunity to help uh, at least with that segment of uh, minimizing flooding of D and Main? So we're doing what we can. That's an existing 42-inch culvert that diagonals across the property. Uh, we did say that their minimum requirement was to reroute it and have no loss of hydraulic capacity. So they, in the reroute, they were going to make it a 48-inch culvert. We have then contributed another 60,000 to upsize that to a 60 inch culvert that increases the capacity about four, fourfold. Uh, we felt that was a wise investment. We've had substantial flooding and had the spring in April. Um, anytime we have an opportunity to have that system changed out to buy additional capacity, um, we think it's, it's a good investment. So this, we are doing that in this case. Sweet. Did you say that the state also uh, gives the money in four installments the same way Correct. that the city would to them. The agreements so, are in parallel. They're, okay. the, they're the same milestones in each agreement. Uh, so it's all done the same. 
and the um, the amount of what's considered public infrastructure in that project, the sidewalks and the lighting, was over seven hundred thousand. So this is just goes towards seven hundred fifteen for Hog Creek, the base without the oversizing. Mm -hmm. um, so the base cost to do the forty-eight inch culvert, that plus the sidewalk street trees is a seven hundred fifteen thousand. And that's all considered public infrastructure. Correct. Yes. Got anything in? I'm just curious, do you happen to know how much funding is in the, um, trying to look for the name of it, the Opportunity Fund Incentive Program? I, as far as annually, what the yeah, state I'm just curious. budgets, I don't. Hmm. I really don't. This is our first actual Opportunity Fund agreement that we have. Uh, th the program, I think, was developed three or four years ago, if yeah, I recall correctly. It hasn't correctly. been around very long. Uh, so it hasn't been there very often, uh, very long. I do not know what the state appropriates every year into that program. It was meant to compete with similar programs in Washington, Utah, and Oregon. No, I think it's a good idea. Um, is this one for consent? Certainly. You okay with that? As long as we think people are going to understand what this is. That's the only... Well, or we could put it on regular and brag ourselves up a little bit. I'll be there anyways. It's up to... Yeah, it up to probably the wouldn't hurt. Yep. Um, in order that people know exactly what's going on. It would dovetail very nicely with the decision made by uh, the county commissioners. So mm -hmm. we could certainly put it on regular. Certainly yeah. goes towards making us business friendly, doesn't it? So yeah, let's put it on regular. Okay, please. happy to do so. Bill, we're done with you. Thank you. Thank you. However, we have Tim Davis who's gonna come up and talk to us about the Recycling Center update and program. Good afternoon. Hello. What you got for us, Tim? I'd like to start and speak to you folks a little bit about our recycling event that we had this weekend, a plastic packaging event. Um, we held our first plastic film packaging collection event on Saturday at the Moscow Recycling Center, um, South Parking Lot, adjacent to C Street. Um, myself, Amanda Bashaw from Latah County, Solid Waste. <laughs> Councillor Bonzo, and then we also had three volunteers from the U of I Sustainability Center, as well as Moscow Recycling staff all assisted with that event. Um, <coughs> we were able to collect 520 pounds of plastic at the event, which ran from 10 till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And that amount coupled with another 260 pounds of plastic film, which was delivered by the charter school the evening prior to the event, we attempted and were successful at running the material through Moscow Recycling's large baler. Uh, we, no one was really certain on how much material it was going to take to make, make a bale in that large baler, but um, staff estimated that it would take somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 pounds um, for the bale to be able to hold together. So um, this gives us a better idea of what kind of volume we need. Um, to use that larger baler as well as how much space is required to store the material prior to the baling. Um, the bale will be delivered to Safeway and then sent to Trax in Reno, Nevada where it will be manufactured into composite decking and railing products. There was a good turnout at the event and it gave us the opportunity to pass on information to participants about the different options currently available to them for recycling plastic film here in Moscow. Um, we've got Safeway, Winco, Moscow Food Co-op, and also the Moscow Charter School are places accepting the material. Um, the event showed me that there is a great deal of interest in recycling plastic film and scheduling another event or <coughs> possibly something on a more permanent uh, basis such as a scheduled monthly event may be warranted. Um, that's something that I will continue to look at and speak with the folks at Moscow Recycling about. Um, I, everybody there was just super excited about it. And, um, <coughs> Tim, I might just mention that I had many people already say, oh, I just heard about it. Are they going to do it again? And I said, it's possible. So if it, you know, I think yeah, I, I, I think, I think, I think that's again? something that we, we should definitely work toward, yeah. and that's something I'll be working toward. Um, I do really like the idea of a manned event for this material um, in particular. It creates more of a controlled environment and allows the material to be screened, you know, versus a 24-7 drop-off container. 
Um, the problem is there's just so many different types of plastics out there, it just becomes confusing, um, not only for the folks delivering, but the folks accepting. Um, we were lucky to have Catherine there. She's the expert in this business. And um, we were sir. taking pictures of something weird that would show up, and she was uh, uh, emailing them to uh, or texting them to uh, Trex to see, you know, is this a yes or a no? You know, it's just there's just so many types of plastic out there. It's just amazing. Tim, I also heard feedback that of people that were dropping off that were very appreciative of all the volunteers that were there, including your, you know, yourself, explaining what they could bring and what they couldn't bring. Yeah. So having someone there to give it that was a great is, opportunity to speak mm -hmm. to people and explain to them, you know, what we were trying to do here and you know where this may go as well. And you know, if they had something that wasn't acceptable, we explained why and so on and so forth. So it was a it was a good it was a good deal all the way around. Um, while most of the participants did a good job at segregating their materials, we had our share of wishful recyclers that brought in items that had to be discarded but you know it, it wasn't as bad as one might think um, comments that we received from the participants were that many felt that there was not enough prior notice <coughs> given to the event which um, we did try to get that out there with a blurb in the utility billing insert several weeks prior and we also posted the event on the website and our social media and I know Moscow Recycling posted it on their website. But um, as this moves forward, you know, we're all kind of learning as we're going through this process. We'll, we'll work harder to get that word out and, and try to reach as many folks as we can. So um, that's it on the event, unless you guys had any questions. And I can address the Recycling Center a little more. Um, Following the 2017 China ban on uh, recycling exports going into China, um, recycling commodity markets have all just plummeted. Um, the domestic markets now have such an abundant supply from what was once going to China, it has caused the recycling markets to just tank. Um, Leitas Sanitation of Moscow Recycling receives revenues for operating the recycling center by two sources. The city pays LSI Moscow Recycling a processing fee based on tonnage of the material that they accept at the recycling center. <coughs> the city also allows LSI and Moscow Recycling to retain the revenues from the sale of those recycling materials that are collected and accepted there at the center. LSI and Moscow Recycling has been seeking extraordinary <coughs> relief from the city for revenue losses that they've experienced at Moscow Recycling Center following the recycling commodity pricing downturn. Following the relief request from LSI and Moscow Recycling, city staff has been reviewing their financial records and is continuing discussions with LSI and Moscow Recycling Management regarding this request for relief. And although we have conceptual layout drawings of the proposed recycling center renovations and have discussed the repurposing of the current processing building there at Moscow Recycling by possibly relocating it at the city shop property, staff has taken a pause and is not prepared in moving forward with the Moscow Recycling plans in light of these circumstances. So there's a lot going on, um, not only with the event and the the plastics and everything else. There's a, there's a whole lot of things in play right here at this time. So that's why we've kind of backed off at you know the the recycling renovations and so forth. Gary, yeah, part of it's a timing issue. Um, that area of town, has, as council knows, you just heard the MZ project. That area of town is changing somewhat in use. So. Um, council's initial direction to renovate the recycling center where it is and we started down that path has been delayed not because of the perhaps change in the character of the neighborhood as much as we try to be as efficient as we can and if we can repurpose the current recycling building for another city use we want to be able to do that because ultimately it will save the taxpayers money however you can't take a building down, stack it like a tinker toy, and then reconstruct it. It's You get your most efficient when the same contractor that dismantles it moves it to the new site and puts it right back up. So it's taking us some time as we're building our CIP as well, uh, our capital improvement program, 
to as soon as it's removed to have a place for it to go <coughs> and that's taking some time the recycling center as it sits right now is still usable not as efficient as it could be which is one of the things council wanted to address but we're continuing to see deterioration of the recycling markets and recycling's costs are going up more and more as you've seen in Pullman which is now charging for recycling Lewiston either is or they are about to uh, the cost of recycling has always been more expensive than uh, landfilling that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do and council recognized that many decades ago and we have one of the most active recycling programs in the state uh, if not the country however there also comes a point where you need to look at the financial impacts of that when the costs you know one of the revenues that Tim talked about was the sale of the commodities if that goes down and thereby raises the cost of recycling to the system we need a chance to absorb that run some financial models and bring those back to council as well so along with the physical constraints of being able to relocate the building with the financial modeling that needs to be done looking at volumes addressing uh, the request from Leta sanitation all of these things together just have caused us to be in flux so it's taking some time to move forward but uh, we're still working on it. it's just not moving as quickly as we kind of sounds like it's a good idea to sit and reflect and make sure we're taking the right steps that are most efficient and economic rather than just to plunge ahead with a model that may not be valid any longer well our thought as staff is to provide the council with as much information as possible you can sift through it and determine what you want to move forward with at that time and with the markets changing the way they have what made sense two years ago may not make sense in the same way now so we just want to have the best information possible to give you for you to make a decision Cool. Is, is there any possibility of improving the yard drop-off part even with that building in place with what's there now is there any way to it's even been expanded temporary? about as much as it can be on the last go around when did we do that and that's been Dean Wyan designed it that's been a long time ago it, it was completed years. just before I came on board I believe in 11 years ago <clears throat> so so you feel with the space that's there there's really no way to reconfigure it with the building in in its place like the not without putting a bunch of fill in and expanding the yard which you could spill over into the c street the piece of property adjacent to c street we looked at that at one time and the amount of fill and the retaining walls you'd have to change the configuration of Asbury Street or or Almond, excuse me, or you'd have to allow people to turn around on a platform, which meant you had to build that much farther into the footprint. So, yeah, the cost was. We looked at all those options years ago, and it's it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's that's part of the conceptual plan as well. Is it's not just the recycling part, but it our conceptual drawings actually doubles the size and there's there's no direct access to the street for yard waste disposal in the new conceptual plans it it's it's um it's a really neat design i think um hopefully we can bring that forward before too long um with the markets the way they are it's just really everything's in flux um and the only thing the only commodity that's really held any price at all is aluminum and that stayed pretty steady mm -hmm. the metals but you know like cardboard has decreased since the ban at around 66 percent and continues to go down uh, <coughs> our single stream commodities um, have um, decreased in value by 82 percent um, mixed paper there's hardly a market left out there I mean when we have to start paying to get rid of some of these commodities we just like oh no you know it's like so yeah I mean it seems all the recycling part is certainly changing and all these uncertainties and that definitely I agree it we don't know how that's all gonna uh, turn out it almost seems like the yard waste thing is separate I mean that's always going to be something mm -hmm. a service we want to have and mm -hmm. it's it's we're not s selling that I mean that's yeah, as you re recall 
when we initially talked about the recycling center, we talked about having a separate yard waste drop off, maybe somewhere toward the outskirts of town. The discussion at that time was if you could take it directly out to the solid waste processing facility seven miles east of town, does it make sense to build a couple million dollar drop off when you might have a better opportunity to do something like that? You have to remember, too, the current plan, the conceptual plan that was put together takes the bailing, the, the delivery and bailing of single stream recycling out of the recycling center footprint. That's how we mm -hmm. created more space for some limited drop off, but also to create additional space for additional yard waste drop off mm -hmm. space. So yep. that's something else that we need to follow the franchise, be able to ask Leita Sanitation, Moscow Recycling, to respond to a expanded service for creating that facility at the solid waste processing facility for us to essentially create more space at the current site. So again, with the price of commodities falling down, everything's in flux right now. Have gone up and down, but I've never <coughs> seen anything like this in my 40 year career at ever. I Are just you talking mean, about prices I, no, or this I mean, project? when we oh. look at the, looking at the recycling center, getting this back oh, on the. Well, I'd say within six months to a year okay. easily. Because we, we, as we're moving forward on the city shop, which is one of the council's strategic planning uh, um, initiatives we need to get that set up to remove the building to begin with so it's going to be moving ahead not as quickly as we'd like but i'd say within the next year okay so not a long stall no and then any idea of when we might um when you might know if that plastic drop-off thing will happen again. I know there's a lot of things that you have to evaluate in that process. I feel fairly certain that it will. I don't want to put a timeline on yeah. it now. Okay. I still need to have mm -hmm. discussions with Moscow Recycling and um, get their feel for it. Um, there'll, there'll likely be an additional cost, but you know, after seeing that Saturday, it just it, it made me feel like you know this is something we need to do. Well. Thank you for being there and yes. making it all happen. Sure. Thank you, Tim. You bet. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. So last item on the agenda is the Regional Housing Study Workshop Update starring Gary Reedner. Yeah, when the Regional Housing Study uh, was brought forward by PEP and uh, uh, Brian Points and presented to Council, it was the report had not been officially distributed at that point because uh, PEP was trying to manage presenting it to the different funders and different governmental entities. So about a week and a half later, the report was distributed. Council, uh, at the initial uh, presentation, it indicated they would like a chance to digest the report once it comes in and then have it come back. It appears now that we will be putting some sort of um, presentation together, if you will, or or uh, discussion by council at council meeting on December 2nd. So it's a fairly light agenda so far. So it looks like there'd be a chance for council to have some discussion at that time. So uh, we'll go ahead, put that on the future agenda list and bring that forward. Great. Okay, good enough. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay. Thank We're you very adjourned. much. Thank you.